1951 British Grand Prix. Unbridled horsepower, explosive fuel, breakneck speeds. For many, it's about national glory. For one man, it's all about revenge. Denzel Ferrari is driven to win. The moment has arrived to settle an old score. It all came to a head at Silverstone. Ferrari is betting on the one ingenious advantage his new machine has. It was all going to break down to, was Enzo right? Was he going to win? Enzo Ferrari will do whatever it takes to motivate his team. No one did psychological warfare better than Enzo Ferrari. He was absolutely brutal. His drivers will give their all to help build the Ferrari dynasty. But in this duel, you can lose much more than the race. Better you blow it up than go too slow. In the history of man, there are critical chapters that forge together a daring individual, a crucial situation, and an innovative technology. Fate's fusion of man, moment, machine. Hi, I'm Hunter Ellis. In the automotive world, one name more than any other stands for speed, style, sex, and success. Ferrari. But in 1951, Enzo Ferrari, the man behind the world's most recognized auto brand, has struck out as a race car driver and as a manager of Alfa Romeo's racing division. But now, armed with his new 375 Formula One car, Ferrari has a chance to strike back. July 14th, 1951 the British Grand Prix in Silverstone, England. Argentinian driver Jose Froilan Gonzalez is behind the wheel of Enzo Ferrari's new 4.5 liter Formula One racer. Gonzalez is in a fierce duel with the driver for the world champion Alfa Romeo team, the legendary Juan Manuel Fangio. Enzo Ferrari's strategy is to make a more fuel efficient car than that of his nemesis, Alfa Romeo. That way, he may be able to win the race not on the track, but in the pits. Ferrari had been chasing Alfa Romeo, and it was finally the day where Ferrari could win. They had the right car, they had the right drivers, they had the right engine, they had the right fuel strategy. They could win. This showdown has been coming ever since Enzo Ferrari cut ties with Alfa Romeo in 1939. A win by Ferrari would unseat the dominant automaker in Formula One racing which in 1951 is the premier international automotive competition. Its roots stem from the daring racing spectacles of the turn of the century. In the early 1900s, everything was new. Cars were new, airplanes were new, the engine was new, it was just brand new. So obviously, if you made a car and you wanted to see if it was any good, you raced the fellow down the street who had one as well. These are indeed the Wild West days of auto racing. As huge a technological leap as the automobile is, however, there are no provisions for driver safety. Today's drivers are protected by Nomex fire suits and carbon fiber helmets, and the cars themselves are built to protect the driver in the event of a crash. But in the early days of racing, many men wore only goggles, and the cars themselves didn't even have seat belts. But still, these brave men tore across the city streets, country roads, and racetracks with reckless abandon. Drivers with names like Ascari, Moss, Fangio, and the great Tazio Nuvolare risk their lives every time they get behind the wheel. These were, you know, ballsy men. They were tough. They were purists. And Ferrari was a purist. You know, racing's, we're not here to talk about safety. You know, rage, racing's a dangerous sport, and you know, people are gonna die, and this is what we have to do. Ferrari, too, is a risk taker. In 1920, at the age of 22, he begins racing cars for Alfa Romeo. Soon, he is managing the racing team and builds up a stable of drivers. European race organizers eventually develop a set of rules restricting engine size and length of race course and call it Grand Prix. But the rules have more effect on spectators and sportsmanship than driver safety. Well, there was a certain romance associated with the danger. And there was a heroic aspect as far as I was concerned 
personally. It was so demanding and it was so unforgiving that if you went out there after having spent all night in a bar, most of the ones that were burning the candle at both ends were gone pretty quickly. Since the drivers have no seat belts, roll bars, or fire protection, a fatal accident is a common sight at almost any race. Today, Formula One isn't completely safe, but at least it's sane. A lot of the technology behind Formula One race cars has changed since 1951. So to get an idea about those differences, I'm here with Robert Prevo, the owner of the American Racing Academy. Hi, Robert. Hi, Hunter, how are you? Safety's a huge concern. Huge uh, concern. One of the things that used to kill a lot of, of drivers was that in crashes, uh, you'd see the, the, the fuel tanks explode. Okay. So we fixed that by essentially creating an envelope around the fuel cell that's a, a rubber bladder, if you will, that allows the, the, the fuel to be contained in the case of a, an accident. Well, essentially, the most important aspect of the inside of the cockpit are the seat belts. The seat belts are there designed to hold the driver firmly in place, so you focus all of his attentions on driving the car. Now, I know these can experience a lot of G-forces, and I love G-forces. Any chance of hopping in the cockpit and taking her for a spin? Got a driver's license? Yeah, and I think I have a few tickets, but that's a good thing in this sport, right? <laughs> let's do it. All right, let's all right. go. <laughs> now, they don't just hand you the keys to a Formula One race car and let you go. First of all, there are no keys. These cars are started by an external motor. Before you can even think about taking this baby on the track, you need to complete the Academy's driving course. All right, guys, want to uh, officially welcome everyone to the American Racing Academy. All right, ready to roll. I start the day driving a Formula 2000 car, a scaled down Formula One car with about one fifth the power of its big brother. Good job. It still does zero to 100 miles per hour in 6.4 seconds and has a top speed of 140 miles per hour. Just use all your senses. Pay attention to where you're looking, what you're feeling, how many Gs you're feeling, what your feet are doing, what are your hands doing, all that. I guess the Navy taught you a little bit about that, huh? Oh yeah, just gotta be comfortable with it. When I finally get to climb into the Formula One car, I realize that this is going to be a whole new deal. I'm right. Driving this car requires absolute concentration, and the acceleration will throw you back in your seat like a jet launching off an aircraft carrier. A modern F1 engine wants to rev over 18,000 RPM and can develop well over 700 horsepower. That's nearly twice the power of a 1950s era F1 and enough to take the car over 200 miles per hour. Yeah! Yeah! Woohoo! Oh man, this is a rocket ship on wheels, man. So, uh, you guys need a driver? <laughs> By the 1950s, the popularity of Grand Prix racing thrusts it into an intense and costly international competition. In those days, you know, the Germans wanted to win for German pride, the Italians, nationalism, you know, and all that. And there was an enormous amount of pressure on a driver to perform. It's kind of like the Olympics. Even the Olympics pale in comparison to the competition that starts brewing in 1938, when Alfa Romeo reduces Enzo Ferrari from director of racing operations to a lower management position. The demotion propels Ferrari out the door with a huge chip on his shoulder. Before Ferrari can build his own racing business, World War II puts Grand Prix racing on hold. Across Europe, automotive factories are converted to manufacture military weapons, parts, and supplies. Auto racing re-emerges in Europe with four Grand Prix races held in 1946. Countries that were bombing each other just a year ago are now battling for the lead on the track. In Italy, there's a new automaker entering the fray. After being replaced as the manager of Alfa Romeo's racing division, Enzo Ferrari has a score to settle, and he's built his own factory to do it. 1946, Marinello, Italy. Scuderia Ferrari, formerly a stable of Alfa Romeo racing cars, is now the designation for Enzo Ferrari's factory and racing team. 
Here, some of Italy's top designers, metallurgists, and mechanics are working to fulfill Ferrari's dream of building the fastest cars in the world, or at least fast enough to beat an Alfa Romeo. Ferrari wanted to beat Alfa Romeo, and they didn't want to beat Alfa Romeo. They wanted to beat Alfa Romeo decisively. But the problem is, Alfa had a huge head start, and Ferrari was perpetually playing catch up. But the war has been particularly disastrous for Alfa Romeo. Heavy Allied bombing has seriously damaged their factories. Only a few Alfetta 158s survive. Alfa had hidden their cars and basically rolled out their pre-war racing team. Little development, you know, little, maybe some better tires, but they had the dominant car that still survived because there was virtually nothing left of Mercedes or of Auto Union. So when the racing started again in the late 40s, Alfa Romeo had the tool to win the races, already pre-developed, just mothballed for a few years, ready to go. In 1947, the Scuderia rolls out the first pure Ferrari, the 1.5-liter Tipo 125. It's the beginning of Enzo Ferrari's love affair with the 12-cylinder engine. At the time, the use of a V12 engine was a very advanced concept. Small motor designed by engineer Colombo, supercharged. The small motor created a great deal of horsepower, but not a lot of torque. Over the next two years, Ferrari further develops the 125, winning several regional races along the way. But Ferrari has his eye on the grand prize of racing, the 24 hours of the Le Mans Endurance Race. The 1949 event will be Ferrari's debut on the international stage. But his rival, Alfa Romeo, is now focused on rebuilding from the war and won't be there. Le Mans, for me, is the best race in the world. And it's probably next to Spa, the fastest track in the world. I mean, you had, at that time, before they put the chicane in, you had a straight that was literally three and a half miles long. It's a 24-hour race. The weather is not good there, but, you know, that's the magic. Each team has two drivers that race in shifts. Ferrari's team consists of British driver Lord Selsden and American Luigi Canetti. They'll drive an updated Tipo 125 12-cylinder sports car with a larger, more powerful engine. Before the race even begins, the Ferrari team runs into trouble. Lord Selsden is sick and unable to drive. If Ferrari's going to compete, Luigi Canetti will need to do the impossible. Drive non-stop for 24 hours. June 1949. A new European car builder is on a mission to take down his rival, an Italian automotive giant. The man is Enzo Ferrari. The moment, a showdown with Alfa Romeo, still two years away. The machine, the Ferrari 375, which has yet to be built. Ferrari's immediate goal is to win the 1949 24 Hours of Le Mans. But he starts the race with a huge disadvantage. It looks like his driver, Luigi Canetti, will have to race for 24 hours straight by himself. This is a killer in the real sense of a race because there's fog, it's obviously at night, uh, it's a big long road circuit with a, like a three mile straight. And so you've got very high speed cars overtaking a slow car at night with poor lights. So there's huge accidents and many people killed. Canetti drives the Ferrari courageously for a full day and through the night. Miraculously, Canetti crosses the finish line in first place after driving a total of 23 and a half hours, handing the wheel over to Selston for just 30 minutes. All those endurance races are something that the automobile manufacturers love to say, look, we, we did it, we went up against the best and we won and prevailed and uh, it says something about the machine that's uh, pretty special. In partnership, Canetti and Ferrari take steps to capitalize on the win. Well-heeled clientele, especially Americans, clamor to buy the car that won Le Mans. 
And since the car looked much like a street car, it was very akin to the road cars and provided a tremendous stepping stone for Ferrari to be able to sell the cars on the road, claiming that they were indeed the equal of the world's best. Ferrari's venture into consumer sales brings the name even more recognition. But unlike other companies that race for the sole purpose of selling cars, Ferrari sells his cars so that he can support his racing. For Enzo, everything revolves around the sport he fell in love with as a child. Enzo Anselmo Ferrari is born February 18, 1898 in Modena, Italy. In 1908, his father takes 10-year-old Enzo to an automobile race in Bologna. Enzo is instantly captivated and decides he'll be a race car driver when he grows up. He was bitten by the bug. He kind of caught the fever and he loved the, uh, the spectacle of auto racing and the speed. As a young man, Enzo spends World War I shoeing mules, but his life is about to enter the fast lane. He moves to Turin, the center of Italian automobile manufacturing and frequents the trattorias where the racing crowd gathers. Enzo uses his charisma to make valuable contacts. Enzo Ferrari, uh, when he really got interested in racing, wanted to work for Fiat, but he wasn't able to secure a good job there. But through some of his connections, he worked for a company that's no longer in business called CMN. In 1919, Enzo enters his first race, the Parma Poggio di Percetto. And luckily uh, for uh, Enzo, he actually did pretty well coming in fourth. Uh, he went on to uh, rouse the interest of the very dominant uh, Alfa Romeo company and uh, got a ride there. He continued to drive for Alfa throughout the 20s and I think did his last race right around 1931. In 1923, after winning a race for Alfa Romeo, Enzo Ferrari is approached by the parents of a legendary Italian World War I flying ace, Francesco Baracca. Even though he was shot down and killed, Baracca's parents suggest that the prancing horse design that was painted on the side of his plane will bring Ferrari good luck. He also added the yellow background of Modena, the color of Modena, to the symbol, and that's basically the beginning of the legend of Ferrari. Enzo's racing career is proceeding moderately well until he fails to show up on the day of a major race. Some speculate that he suffers a nervous breakdown. Others believe it was illness. No matter which, Enzo Ferrari will never again compete as a driver on the international racing circuit. I think what happened, he just got intimidated and overwhelmed. And I think uh, Nicola Romeo uh, realized that. Even though, I mean, he was good, but you know, certainly not top tier. Nicholas started to realize that his real talents lied in that organization and uh, management. That's what he was good at. He had a talent for picking the right people for the right job, and he also had a talent, an uncanny talent, to be the right place at the right time. Ferrari's confidence and salesmanship allow him to lure Italy's top automotive engineers away from his competition. Over the years, he recruits brilliant designers, including Vittorio Iano, Joaquino Colombo, and Aurelio Lampredi. He's a marketing, a marketing and management genius. He had the talent to, to recognize people that had mechanical ability, and not necessarily college graduates. A lot of the development of the cars were craftsmen, if you will, that he recognized had a genius mechanical talent. At 31, Ferrari orchestrates a cooperative enterprise with Alfa Romeo and a group of wealthy auto enthusiasts. In 1929, he opens the doors of Scuderia Ferrari in Modena, his hometown. Here, he prepares Alfa Romeo cars for competition. He was Machiavellian and justified to me that he would do anything and be ready to get what he wanted, but he had the talent to know what he needed and how to get it done. That was his genius, you know, and which created the, the legend. In 1932, Ferrari's wife, Laura, gives birth to his first son, Dino. Enzo eventually fathers a second boy, Piero, out of wedlock and leads a very private double life with his mistress, Lena Lardi. You know, the best paparazzis in the world are in Italy and England. So you know there's dirt there, and I'm sure they were looking for it, and they felt like, you know, hey, we're the press, you have to answer to us. Well, Enzo Ferrari didn't look at it, you know, it's none of your business. You know, ask me about my race cars. 
Ferrari demands perfection and total commitment from his employees, resorting to hard-nosed tactics to motivate his workers. Eh, non è possibile essere pronto in due, una settimana, non è possibile. Però non avete capito, io questo lavoro lo voglio terminato per sabato. Ma solo una non ci sono, no, 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 non ci sono scuse. Voglio che questo lavoro venga fatto per sabato. Io questa gara la voglio vincere. Sì. Però me la faccio fare da Francesco, saresti in grado di farlo? Ce la fai o non ce la fai? Ok? No one did psychological warfare better than Enzo Ferrari. He was absolutely brutal. Play all kinds of psychological games. You know, there was already enough pressure, but really just to push him over the end to really push him. In its first year, Scuderia Ferrari competes in 22 events, collecting eight victories for Alfa Romeo. Ferrari is known to not only pit his drivers against those from competing teams, but against each other. Enzo, having been a driver, himself in his earlier days he had a pretty he had pretty good insight into what sort of motivation would work with drivers if he wanted them to reach down to the bottom of the barrel and scrape some more he loved drivers that would do that Roberto Bello non va bene così ok ce la devi mettere tutta No, no, ce la devi mettere tutta, bello mio. Ok, no, no, no. Devi dare più gas. Devi dare più gas. Io questa gara la voglio vincere. Of course, you always push the drivers to go to the max. Better you blow it up than go too slow. And uh, some drivers stood the test and some didn't. And some got killed. In 1938, when Alfa Romeo decides to bring all their racing operations back in-house, Ferrari quits, takes his loyal designers, and starts his own car company. He was just itching to go racing and do it under his own name, but he had signed a non-compete, which forbade him to use his, his trademark prancing horse uh, or the Ferrari name with anything associated with racing for a period of four to five years. During the war, Ferrari's factory manufactures parts and machine tools for the Italian army. After his Modena facility is bombed, an older and wiser Ferrari moves his factory to Marinello and starts all over again. Buongiorno ragazzi, buongiorno. Come va? Conoscete Dino, no? Ferrari had nothing. Ferrari was starting from ground zero, but he did have the advantage of having the experience of running Scuderia Ferrari. He did have all of the contacts, and he did have Colombo, who came back with him to work together to design an all-new car to go heads up against his competitor, his nemesis, Alfa Romeo. By 1949, following his win at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, Ferrari is gaining momentum. The 1950 Grand Prix at Monaco is his next chance to settle the score with Alfa Romeo and achieve the kind of recognition he needs to build his own business. When they get to Monaco in 1950, Alfa is the giant, Ferrari is the giant killer. Ferrari aspires to beat Alfa at Monaco. If you win at Monaco, that's something that everyone remembers. In 1950, Grand Prix competition is reorganized with a new set of rules, called Formula One. The new rules restrict cars to either a 1.5-liter supercharged engine or a 4.5-liter normally aspirated engine. At Monaco, Ferrari is entering three Tipo 125s with the same type of engine as Alfa Romeo. Both the Alfa 158 and the Ferrari 125 are supercharged, and supercharged is much like turbocharging. Basically, you have a pump that pumps a tremendous amount of air into the engine. The more fuel and air you can get into the engine, the more horsepower. May 21st, 1950. The streets of Monaco are lined with fans and celebrities alike. At noon, the starting flag drops and Ferrari's top driver, Alberto Ascari, takes off toward the lead. It looks like today will be the day for Ferrari to exact his revenge. May 21st, 1950. The Monaco Grand Prix becomes a battle between Ferrari's lead driver, Alberto Ascari, and Juan Manuel Fangio, who is leading the race in an Alfa Romeo. After World War II, they came, Alpha came back with a vengeance.
they still had talented engineers. They had done a lot of research and development in the pre-war era, and they were really masters at developing these cars. So here comes the fledgling Ferrari company, and they're trying to beat the old master. At this point, Enzo Ferrari no longer attends races in person, but monitors the event by radio and telephone. On the streets of Monaco, Ascari tries to steal the lead from Fangio for 197 miles. Ultimately, Fangio wins the race, one lap ahead of the Ferrari. The loss at Monaco is frustrating, but Enzo Ferrari won't be denied. He knows now that to beat his rival, he'll need to build a car that has a clear advantage over Alfa Romeo's potent 158. This will be the defining test of Enzo Ferrari's leadership. He'll need his team's absolute dedication and creativity to build a machine that can win. The wily Ferrari, known to most as Commendatore, or Commander, once again pits one of his engineers against another. Joaquino Colombo is an advocate of the smaller supercharged engine. You're talking about a 1500cc motor, which is 90 cubic inches, so it's a tiny little thing. They were running you know, in excess of 20 pounds of boost in this motor, uh, was putting out in excess of five, higher, five horsepower per cubic inch. I would think the final development was about 450 horsepower. But the problem was, uh, was murder on gas. Keep in mind also pit stops in those days were calibrated by minutes. You know, in modern F1, it's six, seven, eight seconds. These guys got tires, they're gas, they're gone. Well, in those days, you know, uh, a good stop was a minute and a half, two minutes. Well, that's almost a lap. His other engineer, Aurelio Lempredi, favors using a larger, normally aspirated engine, which is less powerful, but uses less fuel. Uh, the V12s, uh, on one hand, had a variety of advantages. One, they didn't have to stop for gas so much. It was much easier on tire. Having uh, such a large engine and having the power distributed through 12 cylinders was much less stress on the motor and made it much easier for the driver to drive it and control it. Ah, domani, allora. Domani. Buon lavoro, Ingegner Lampredi. A domani. Grazie. Buon lavoro. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. After testing both engines, Ferrari finds that the normally aspirated engine develops just the right ratio of torque to horsepower for accelerating out of the corners and reaching top speeds on the straights. Enzo believes he may have just found a way to be a giant killer. The 4.5-liter Lampredi 12-cylinder engine will be the heart of Ferrari's new 375 F1 car. To save weight, both the cylinder block and heads are cast from light alloy. Each bank of cylinders features a single overhead camshaft operating two valves per cylinder. Topped by a set of Weber carburetors, the 375 develops 350 horsepower at 7,000 RPM and can hit 185 miles per hour. Ferrari realized there were many advantages of the 4.5 liter. The primary advantage, of course, was fuel consumption. The 4.5 could normally go through a full Grand Prix with one fuel stop, whereas the much thirstier 158 required two fuel stops. Fully loaded, the 375 holds 25 gallons of fuel. Gasoline weighs about six pounds per gallon, so the Ferrari fuel load is about 150 pounds. The Alphas, which carry 66 gallons of fuel, carry nearly 400 pounds of fuel fully loaded. Weight is the enemy of a racing car. To build the best racing car, one of your primary objectives is to make it as light as possible. Fuel is one of the heaviest aspects of weight in a race car. The more fuel you have to carry on board, the bigger a problem it becomes. In 1951, Enzo has his eye on one of the most prestigious races in the world, the British Grand Prix, to put the 375 to the ultimate test. Ferrari had been chasing Alfa Romeo for five years through 1947, 48, 49, 50, 51, and it was finally the day where Ferrari could win. Racing for Alfa are two top Grand Prix drivers, the legendary Argentinian Juan Manuel Fangio, considered by many to be the greatest racing driver in Formula One history, and the Italian Nino Farina, the first Formula One world champion. For Ferrari, it will be the rookie Argentinian, Jose Froilan Gonzalez, along with Formula One star, Alberto Ascari. Ascari was the team leader for Ferrari. Gonzalez was the, the new guy, but 
Fangio was the master. Fangio was the man to beat. But the man who has the most at stake in the race, Enzo Ferrari, isn't even here. He's at his factory in Marinello, where he'll once again be listening to the race on the radio. Although Ferrari doesn't attend his races, he has total control over every aspect of his company. He handpicks his drivers and oversees every detail during the building of the cars. He believes, though, that by the time the race begins, it's out of his hands. Now it's up to his team to bring home the win. There's a great deal of tension. Everyone's excited. The adrenaline's flowing. The starter drops the flag. All four men on the front row throw in a tremendous amount of throttle, dump the clutch, and immediately smoke the tires. But the race favorites, including the Ferraris, are quickly overtaken by other cars. Enzo Ferrari's dream of defeating Alpha at Silverstone may be dashed at the very beginning of the race. July 14, 1951, Silverstone, England. One man's quest to topple a rival and ascend to the pinnacle of Formula One racing seems to be thwarted yet again. The man is ingenious automaker Enzo Ferrari. The moment is the 1951 British Grand Prix. The machine is the innovative 375 Formula One race car, a car that Ferrari believes will give him the winning edge. Ferrari wants to beat Alfa Romeo, and he's convinced his 375s have the power to do the job. But Juan Manuel Fangio is the leader of the Grand Prix series, and his legendary driving skills have allowed him to pass faster cars before. Gonzalez is in for the race of his life. Back in Marinello, Enzo Ferrari listens intently to the radio. He's surprised to hear that his rookie driver, Gonzalez, has taken an early lead. By the time the leaders came around, the race came around to the lap one, when Gonzalez passed the pits, the one board was out for him, and the mechanics were on fire. They knew that Ferrari had a chance. It was only a function of everything working, and everything had to work right. And for the moment, anyway, everything is working right for Ferrari. But as Gonzalez rounds the ninth lap, a car looms in his rear view mirror. It's Fangio, and he's bearing down on him. So at that point, the driver like Gonzalez has two choices. Does he watch what's going on in front of him, or does he look in the rearview mirror? Looking in the rearview mirror is the most dangerous thing you can do. So he just put his foot down, he kept driving as fast as he could. On the 25th lap, Gonzalez takes a hairpin turn called Beckett's Corner too fast and hits the straw bales that border the track. It's just enough of a delay to let Fangio retake the lead. The cars were very, very equal, and the lap times weren't too dissimilar. So it was all going to break down to, was Enzo right? Was his 4.5 liter the right formula to use? Was he going to win? At the 39th lap, Gonzalez accelerates to 125 miles per hour and overtakes Fangio. Once again, the rookie takes the lead. And then he sees in his mirrors Fangio. And Fangio's coming hard. And they go wheel to wheel for a few laps, and Fangio gets in front. Eventually, both cars need to stop for fuel. Ferrari is betting that if Gonzalez can refuel faster than Fangio, he just might gain the time he needs to win. On a 48th lap, Fangio pulls in for a fuel stop. It takes 49 seconds. Gonzalez charges ahead and gets a full 36-second lead before Fangio can get out of the pits. By the time Gonzalez stops for fuel 13 laps later, he's almost a minute and a half ahead of Fangio. The deciding moment in the Silverstone race is clearly when Gonzalez comes in for his pit stop. He was able to get in and change four tires and fuel and get out in 25 seconds, which was a phenomenal, phenomenal quick pit stop for that time period.
After 191 miles in two hours, 42 minutes, and 18 seconds, Gonzalez crosses the finish line over a minute ahead of Fangio. Ferrari has won his first Formula One Grand Prix, handing Alfa Romeo their first major defeat since 1939. one of the youngest drivers in the Grand Prix circle, Froelen Gonzalez, making his first really big win. But you also you have this new company named Ferrari. Over 30 years later, he finally beat them at their own game. And in an emotional response, he exclaimed, I've killed my mother. I think probably he may have felt bad. Alfa Romeo really picked him up from nowhere. You know, and put him on the map, gave him a huge opportunity. I think he was always appreciative of that. The 375 performs just as Ferrari planned. The car's lighter weight and fuel-efficient engine is ultimately the winning formula. Like a catapult, the victory at Silverstone vaults Ferrari to supremacy in Formula One and puts Alfa Romeo into the pits almost permanently. From this point forward, Ferrari racing cars become dominant in almost all forms of racing. The first six cars to get the chicken flag are all Ferraris. They have beat Alfa Romeo, and subsequently, Alfa Romeo analyzes their position, realizes that they cannot afford to develop a new car, and folds their tent, leaving Ferrari very much in charge, dominant in Formula One. While Ferrari is on fire in the first half of the 1950s, fate is about to deal Enzo a series of blows that will bring him to his knees. Enzo Ferrari has finally beaten his rivals at Alfa Romeo and is well on his way to establishing a Formula One and sports car dynasty. But the decade of the 1950s, which began so bright for Ferrari, becomes a series of tragic events that would cause many men to throw in the towel. At Le Mans in 1955, driver Pierre Levey's Mercedes hits another car at 150 miles per hour. Shrapnel rockets through the grandstand, killing over 80 people in seconds. Just a few weeks later, Ferrari racing legend Alberto Ascari is killed in a freak accident. Both tragedies rocked the racing world. You know, for him, uh, the death of all the drivers and all that, I think, you know, it just came with the territory. I mean, yeah, I'm sure it was unfortunate he got that, but did it ever actually stop him? No. Si pronto. Cosa? But what really set him uh, sideways was the death of Dino. Dino Ferrari, who grows up to become a respected engineer working in his father's factory, dies in 1956 from kidney failure after a lifelong bout with multiple sclerosis. It is by all accounts the most personally traumatic event in Ferrari's life. But he was still determined. He had a vision which he stuck to. He didn't really waver much from that path. He triumphed when there was adversity, both family, personal, and he didn't let these hard times, uh, he didn't let that deter him. He still kept his vision and his mission. Things go from bad to worse for Enzo. In 1957, his driver, Alfonso de Portago, is racing in the legendary Italian 1,000 kilometer open road race, the Mille Miglia. Millions of spectators line the roadways. Suddenly, De Portago's speeding car catches a tire on a roadway marker. In the blink of an eye, his car hurtles into the crowd, killing him and 11 other people, including five children. Looking for a scapegoat, the Italian government blames the tires used on Portago's car. Enzo Ferrari is charged with manslaughter. I mean, there was no merit to it, you know. 
bystanders were getting killed regularly. I mean, you would literally have what would happen. These race cars would come through a town and everyone would line the roads. These were basically bad dirt roads. The car went off, you're taking out five, 10 people. It was a bloodbath out there. After an investigation and four years of legal wrangling, the charges are dropped. And the Italian love-hate relationship with Enzo Ferrari continues. Anytime he won a race, everything was forgiven, of course, and he was back to being a hero. He was bigger than the government. They resent, you imagine all the politicians and everything. Well, the fact was he was. Next to the Pope, you know, he was the number one guy in Italy, and he let everybody know it. In Italy, Enzo Ferrari was and still is God. Since the first win at Silverstone, Ferrari's Formula One standings have not always been on top. Overall, though, with 14 Constructors Championships and records in nearly every category, they are the winningest team in the sport. Ferrari also wins in another way. His cars have become icons, and the prancing horse is the most recognized automotive logo in the world. Today, some of the most prized models, like this 1962 250 GTO, sell for as much as $15 million. Collection curator Scott Thomas lets me take a few turns on the track. I love the sound of the V12. think of an automobile as almost having a life or a personality of its own. And the Ferrari had a special voice and they had a great sound and there was something in that bloodline that was the same. It's simple in one word, it's passion. You get in it, you're in something special. And these cars are built by people who love cars and they love Ferrari. Today, Ferrari produces about 5,000 cars a year, with price tags around $200,000. The company maintains that the racing technology developed on the track migrates into the sports cars, like the limited production Enzo Supercar. Michael Schumacher was one of the persons who developed that car. I mean, you look at the brakes, it's you know, ceramic brakes. Well, that came from F1. The paddle shifting, that's all F1. You know, the variable cam dive, bush rod, suspension, you know, the reservoir, all that. The utilization of carbon fiber, it's all F1 technology. With acceleration of zero to 60 in 3.3 seconds, a top speed of 218 miles per hour, and cornering capability of 1.3 Gs, Enzo owner James DeOrio feels it's more car than some people can handle. The problem with it, it's a race car. It's going back to Formula One technology. The Enzo, you know, uh, it's faster than you. If you're not up to it, and you don't really know what the car is doing, you're gonna get in trouble very quickly. Long after his death in 1988 at the age of 90, Enzo Ferrari's name and accomplishments are a source of pride for many Italians. I think that the legacy that Ferrari himself has left is probably summed up by those Blood red Ferraris screaming down a racetrack. Because when one buys a Ferrari and looks at the horse and the steering wheel, you think of those blood red Ferraris screaming down the Mulsan straightaway or your straightaway on the way home. It was obvious that he had an enormous passion for racing and for his product, his statement in the world of racing. As I look back on it now, I mean, he's probably the most influential single person in racing for the 20th century. When Enzo Ferrari wins the British Grand Prix in 1951, it's a watershed moment in automotive history. It proves to the world that Enzo is not only a brilliant manager, but a man whose vision, leadership, and determination could produce a lineage of vehicles whose appeal and prowess is second to none. Ferrari's success at Silverstone is another example of the M3 factor, a force we'll continue to follow on Man, Moment, Machine.